Hello and welcome to our webinar. Today we are going to be telling you how should you manage your Moodle database and what you can do to get started. To get started, let's have a look at the agenda. We're going to be talking about what is the Moodle database. We're going to be looking through the Moodle database configuration. We're going to go through what to monitor in the Moodle database, the Moodle database schema, the database activities or database activity in Moodle, and also, of course, how you can manage the Moodle database with cluster control. What is the Moodle database? So um, the Moodle database, it obviously stores all of the information related to Moodle. It, Moodle, it uh, supports MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, MS SQL, and Oracle databases. Moodle is developed on pedagogical principles and is obviously used for blended learning, for distance education, for flipped classroom and other e-learning projects in schools, universities, workplaces and also other sectors. Moodle's database is obviously typically MySQL or Postgres, but it can also be, for example, Microsoft SQL Server or, as in this example, Oracle. But as we said, the most frequently used database for Moodle is MySQL. And here you can see how complex the Moodle database actually is. As you can see, there's a lot of things intertwining between each other, but do not fret, we will try to explain how some of these things work in a moment. Before we do so, however, keep in mind that Moodle has a lot of plugins. Moodle actually has thousands of plugins available. At the time of recording, the plugin list includes 1,769 plugins. Obviously, the plugin list is very large, but what we gave you here is um, what you can expect from Moodle plugins. So the Moodle plugin list, it obviously includes gamification plugins, questionnaire plugins, plugins that help teachers, plugins that help students, certificate plugins, etc. Right? And each plugin, it comes with its own schema. So uh, database monitoring, um, for database configuration, you need one file. For example, Moodle has, in the Moodle directory, it has the configuration file named config.php. And uh, in the configuration file, you obviously see a lot of, a lot of options. You need, uh, you need to see the database type, you see the database library, you see database host, name, user, password, and etc. right? And obviously there are other database options available. You just need to look in the um, Moodle's GitHub and other database related options can allow you to, for example, set a limit on the number of rows that are fetched into memory when doing a large record set query. Um, for example, search indexing in PostgreSQL and such things, right? Um, so this file, it helps you to configure your Moodle database. And obviously, when the Moodle database is configured, you also need to monitor it. Not having proper monitoring or metrics is like flying a plane with an eye mask on in a thunderstorm, as this slide obviously tells you. It's not having uh, proper monitoring or metrics is a pretty bad idea, as you can imagine, right? So on monitoring something in Moodle, you need to have, you need to take two things into account. You need to take into account the operating system that you're running and you need to take into account the database that you're running, right? Uh, obviously you need to monitor the metrics and the context of your system. You need to look for alterations in the behavior of patterns. For example, if your system is using um, a lot of CPU, you might have some problem, right? Um, if your system is using high RAM, you probably need to check your database configuration if you have a load uh, if you have a high very high load it's going to be generated by cpu ram or disk usage you obviously need to monitor your database as well so you need to monitor your queries the amount of active sessions you need you need to monitor the amount of um, of database logs etc so here, what, what we did is what we compiled the list of what you should monitor in Moodle. So in our opinion, you should monitor the queries, you should monitor the active sessions, you should monitor the database logs, and obviously you should monitor how your database 
backups perform, right? To monitor queries, you obviously need to know your queries. Uh, what we mean by this is that you need to know what data queries access. Are they using indexes? Are they not using indexes? Do you use partitions? What partitions do you use? Um, what are query patterns? How much queries uh, can you run in one second? How much queries can run at once, right? You can also use explain and other things. Um, you also need to know the number of active sessions because if the number is high, you should increment the maximum value. Or if you don't want to, or if you don't have um, ability to do so, please check if something is wrong. Probably there's something wrong in your database. Um, if you need to monitor database logs, you can do it by just waiting, um, waiting the query to complete or check if it should be running in the first place. Uh, for backups, you obviously need to know that your backups are up to date and, and it can be restored. Now we're going to move towards the Moodle database schema. And the Moodle database schema, it's obviously a very, very powerful beast. The Moodle database schema, it has the configuration files, the configuration table, sorry, the user tables, the groups tables, and also the logging system. So we are going to go through pretty much uh, most important things regarding the database schema. So um, in order to begin working with the database on um, the database schema in Moodle, you need to create a database that stores the Moodle tables in MySQL. If you're using MySQL, obviously, as we said, it's the more most popular choice, but obviously you need um, you need to know that you have other choices as well. You can change the default character set and collation to UTF-8. You can also grant privileges. Keep in mind that when changing the default character set and collation to UTF-8, you should probably use UTF-8 MB4 because it, uh, it's more advanced form of UTF-8 and it can actually show all of the characters in, uh, in MySQL. UTF-8, it's, it's pretty buggy as it seems. You also need to keep in mind the effects of the privileges. For example, if you run the grant all privileges, as you can see in the in the example, you need to keep in mind that the keep uh, that the grant all privileges statement allows a MySQL user full access to a designated database. And there's a few categories of database schemas, as we told you before. Um, there's configuration tables, which consists of config. Uh, which consists of tables that are related to the configuration of Moodle. You have the config table, you have the config log table, you have the config plugins table, and you also have the users and their profile tables, which obviously consist of the information regarding users, right? So you have the user table, the user enrollments table, which obviously consists of the information of the um, courses that a user is enrolled in, you have the user info category, info data, last access, you have the IP address, right, and such things. And uh, Moodle database activities, on the other hand, allows you to build, a display, and search entries on a topic of your choice. Here's where we should probably stop a little bit and explain. So basically, when you're dealing with Moodle, you should probably, you probably saw that you have an ability to to um, add a database activity. A database activity is basically something that allows you to build, display, and search entries on a topic of your choice. So you can uh, um, search many entries. Entries can be files, images, links to websites, text, or whatever else. Activities, they can be moderated, commented, rated, and also displayed as a list, or individually if you so desire. To actually add a database activity, you need to turn on the editing in Moodle, then select the database uh, from the activity chosen. There's a lot of activities, as you can see, there's assignment, there's chat, there's choice, but you need database for this. Database activities can, can also have names and descriptions. And you can um, assign a name and a description for a database activity after you have chosen that. This slide shows you how to turn on the editing and how to actually add a database activity so you can begin working, for, uh, working with it. Keep in mind that you need to be logged in as a teacher to be able to do that.
Obviously, database activities, they work through views. Views can be in, uh, in multiple forms. They can be um, student views. They can also be teacher views. In a student view, students can click on the database icon in the course to access it and add entries. In a teacher view, teachers can see the setup tabs, can edit, approve and unapprove entries as required. Obviously, uh, students cannot access the teacher views. And here to the right, you can see um, what the adding a new database entry looks like. So you have the name, you have the description, and you have some other information that allows you to add a database activity. Obviously, a Moodle database, it can also be monitored with cluster control. So in the next slides, we are going to be telling you how to do that. Cluster control in general, it allows you to set the overview, the information regarding nodes um, and stuff. Cluster control, it can help you with load balancing, adding or removing slave nodes, automatic failover and recovery, backups and many more things. It can help you monitor your database service in real time. It can create alerts which inform of events in your database. It can scale out your database um, and multiple other things which we will be covering in a second. A cluster control, it provides a unified view of all your database instances. Even if you're using multiple data centers, letting you see the big picture or individual nodes. Cluster control is able to centralize backups to protect, secure and recover your data. And it also has support for different native backup methods. So we're talking about extra backup, Reconus extra backup, right? If you're using Maria backup, it can also support that, uh, PG base backup, PG back rest, and others as well. Um, cluster control can encrypt connections between clients and the server using TLS. Galera SSL encryption, for example, can encrypt replication traffic between the database nodes using TLS. The audit log can help you enable policy-based monitoring and logging of connections and query activity. So, so this is a pretty valuable tool. Um, as you can see, this slide shows you what can cluster control help with in your environment. So we're talking about um, security, the logs, and obviously the integration uh, with your custom automation scripts. Regarding logging, uh, we're referring to running and completed jobs, uh, error reports and system logs. Jobs can display created and scheduled backups, also their status, who created them and also obviously when. Error reports can allow you to see the error log file path, size and date. Error reports can also be obviously deleted. System logs allow you to see a list of system logs. So we're talking about the MySQL D log, the proxy SQL log, and the Prometheus log, and amongst others, right? The list of the system logs can also be manually refreshed. And uh, cluster control can also be integrated with your custom automation scripts within with when using a CLI. Here in this slide, you actually see the the how the cluster control can actually help you with backing up your data whether you want to create backups or restore backups or schedule backups it can help you do all of those things so as you can see you can actually choose the method that you need to back up your databases with there are multiple methods there are mysql dump the, there's percona extra backup there's mariadb and there's also ndb backup and we should also mention that the backups can be uploaded to the cloud and also restored. You can also define a schedule to periodically create backups, upload them to the cloud and automatically verify them. Backups can also be restored on a node and a standalone host. You can also create a cluster from a backup or restore from an external backup. Backups can be uploaded to the cloud and also restored as we said. When restored a backup, you can when restoring a backup, you can select a backup you want to restore. You can also make use of time-based or position-based point-in-time recovery. Initially, only the master of the cluster will be will be recovered. So, to the left of the slide, you can actually see what happens when you want to create a backup. 
using using cluster control. And here you can see obviously the overview of of cluster control. Uh, we're going to be talking about a little bit um, how things work in cluster control. So the performance tab it gives an overview of database performance. It shows host advices. So we're talking about swappiness checks, excessive CPU usage, disk space usage, performance schema. Table access without using indexes, top queries, unused indexes, connection information, and stuff, right? They, it checks uh, for system time zone alignment, for you know DB log file sizes and stuff. The database variables list the database variables and the values across database clusters. Um, in the enterprise edition of cluster control, schema analyzer is available. The schema analyzer it checks for redundant indexes, missing primary keys, etc. Uh, the transaction log it shows transaction deadlocks across database instances, together with host database transaction ID, blocking transaction ID, query uh, query duration, and last in that. So cluster control can really help you with a lot of things. Um, as you can see, uh, there's query monitoring. Um, you need, you have to, ha you have the ability to monitor the top queries, the running queries, and the query outliers. Outliers. Query outliers, if it's not clear enough, are queries that deviate more than two sigmas from the average time. At least 100 samples of a query are required. So this is how the um, how the query monitoring um, tab works. Obviously, you, you have the ability to either turn on or turn off query monitoring. You can also add a new integration using a cluster control. Um, a u cluster control, it can be integrated with either PagerDuty, VictorOps, Telegram, Ops Game, Slack, um, ServiceNow, or you can also add your own webhook. Uh, the time to respond to outages is one of the most important metrics to measure. Cluster control integrations were added in cluster control 1.4.2. They do not require any modifying of external files whatsoever. To prevent you from receiving too many notifications, cluster control integrations also allow you to send out only specific critical alerts or warnings. A webhook allows you to integrate cluster control into most existing applications. So basically, if your service is not in this list, you can probably still integrate. Integrate this, right? So that would be it for this webinar. We really enjoyed having you on board. If you want to learn more about several lines, if you want to read our blog, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us directly. And thank you for watching the webinar. Thank you.